Hello and welcome back to our cottage in Somerset. A little bit of a different video today, I thought I would do a Q&A. Uh, and the first reason for doing that is because this community has grown to 10,000 subscribers, which is amazing. Um, and I wanted to have a video uploaded where we can sort of get to know each other a bit better. Um, so I've asked for some questions on a post on YouTube and on Instagram as well. And I've I'm just going to pick out the ones that are the most common or the most interesting um, and we can get to know each other and also because there's a heat wave going on at the moment it's been super hard to film garden content it's just really uncomfortable out there the garden's looking completely dead the grass is all brown very difficult to work on that kind of content so in the meantime here's a Q&A the most common question was what do I do for a job um, and I've been working as a content creator for about 10 years now, um, mostly on Instagram but I am starting to take my eggs out of that basket and I'm hoping to do more and more work on YouTube and TikTok. In the last year I've had a really big shift to doing more video content, um, I've started doing a lot more work on TikTok, I don't love it. Um, to be honest, I much more prefer YouTube. I like artsy, slow-paced, relaxing content and the things that TikTok and Instagram are asking for now are too in your face for me and I don't enjoy using them anymore, to be quite honest. So that's why I'm starting to move over to YouTube. Um, so I'm super excited about the journey that's going to happen here. It's very early days for us. Um, we've only really been making videos for about half a year. Um, and excited to see what's to come. And I also feel like Instagram, it seems like it's a bit of a dying platform, um, which is another reason for moving away from it. One question that I got asked quite a bit was, how did you get into gardening? And I'm still very early into my gardening journey. I've only been doing it for about three years, but I've loved gardens for a really long time. And since I was about 19, um, I got a National Trust membership and I started visiting these places on the weekends. I don't care so much for the history. I like the houses um, if they're old and quirky and like a cottage, but I'm not really interested in big, grand, fancy, lots of money houses. <laughs> Silas. You got an itch. I much prefer the gardens. Um, so since I was 19, I was going to gardens uh, every weekend. I had a massive list. I would go on road trips and I never really thought that I could garden myself um, for one, because I didn't have a garden um, and I'd never seen anyone my age doing it. And I was a bit embarrassed about it. Um, and at the time I was working in an office and I remember people asking, oh, what did you do on the weekend? And everyone else would have been to really cool parties. And I was there being awkward, like I went to a National Trust garden actually. And I just felt really embarrassed that I had a hobby that felt like it was a bit inappropriate for my age maybe. Um, but I loved it. Um, and I'm glad I don't work in, in an office anymore. Um, and then on Instagram, I came across a niche for allotment holders and I saw people my age doing gardening and growing food. And I, it was like something clicked for me and I was like, oh, I don't need access to a garden. I can do this at an allotment. So um, we found an allotment uh, while we were living with Aaron's parents and we were going to start a garden there. Uh, I've got everything sorted. And then very suddenly, um, a lot of things changed all at once and we had to move house and we ended up here. Uh, and it was some sort of luck, miracle, whatever, that we ended up in a place with a really big garden. Uh, I think a lot of people that knew me weren't really expecting uh, me to be this interested in gardening, maybe because of my age. I don't know, but uh, we know ourselves better than other people know us, I think, a lot of the time anyway. So I'm glad we persevered and now uh, we've lived here for three years and I've been gardening slowly over that time. Um, but it wasn't like... We never really had a big amount of money to do a hardcore garden project. We're doing it in little bits as a, at a time when we can afford to or when we, when we get time to. I've had a few questions about autism, which I talk more about on Instagram than I do on YouTube. I'd like to talk about it a bit more on YouTube, but I don't really know how, to be honest, um, because when you use YouTube, it does put you in a niche quite quickly, and I'm very much in the gardening niche. I don't know exactly how to segue in uh, the autism, um, but I've got questions like, um, what are your special interests, um, how do you deal with noise, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, I was diagnosed as autistic a few years ago but I've known for much longer because it's quite hard to get diagnosed as an adult and as a feminine presenting person. Um, 
and I've talked about that a lot on Instagram so if you would like to see I've also got a couple of videos I can link to uh, about wedding planning where I go into more detail about autism um, so I'll link to that above but in terms of special interests I think it's got to be gardening and it's been gardening for a very long time or gardens in some shape or form whether that's visiting them um, uh, in the winter when I can't go outside so much I just read books or I've been to watch gardening programs and it's definitely something that I feel gives me life and it's like my reason for existing and I'm very glad that I know what that is and I can spend time enjoying it whether that is through gardening or whether it's through reading about gardening or watching other people gardening talking about it um, whatever I don't know if it counts as a special interest but I also know that animals are a really big part of my life and that that can be an autistic trait as well because I don't really like being around people very much. Um, I like making videos from a distance but actually I don't enjoy being in a crowd and I don't really enjoy talking to people or socialising um, but I could spend all day with animals. Um, I could go a really long time without feeling lonely, without having people in my life but if I didn't have animals in my life I would feel miserable and so I have our two dogs, Epi and Silas, which are bumbling around the room now. They'll pop in and out of this video. And at the moment, we've got six ducks. That number's fluctuated over time. The lowest amount we've had has been three. At one point, I think we had ten. <laughs> uh, they come and go, but um, absolutely love animals and definitely would like to get some more animals in the future. I've had a few questions on how to start gardening and being intimidated at those early stages. Um, and I think my advice would probably be in those situations that to a certain extent, failure is a good thing because that's how we learn. And if, you're, if you've done something and it hasn't worked out, it's been a learning curve and you might have picked up some information that you could never have got without making that failure. So I think it's good to try a few different things, um, expect some failure and know that when you do fail, it's a good thing. There are some plants that are easier than others. It will obviously depend where you live, but here, for example, I find bulbs are really easy and really rewarding in terms of food, things like peas, squashes. Even if you go to a garden center and buy vegetable starter plugs where someone else has grown the uh, plant for you, you just pop it in the ground and watch it grow. Something that will motivate you, make you feel really rewarded and make you want to keep going rather than jumping straight in at the deep end um, and being really overwhelmed. And I think also it's important to bear in mind that nobody knows everything and we're all learning. I don't know everything. I pick bits that I'm interested in, learn about them and then I'll move on to something else. Um, but it's always an ongoing journey and so you shouldn't be intimidated by how much other people appear to know about something. And it can be good to exchange knowledge with other people as well if they do know more than you. But um, I think really the best advice is just give it a go and try not to be scared of failure because even the most, uh, the most well-established gardeners will have failure. Sometimes things are beyond your control. It might be due to weather or pests or some soil nutrients. It could be any number of reasons. Uh, things will go wrong and that's something to be embraced rather than scared of. One question that I got asked was how did we find our house and what did that process look like? Um, so things happened quite suddenly um, in our lives and we'd been saving up for a long time. So we, I started a help to buy ISA when I was a teenager and I put in whatever I could at the time. Uh, I think it was just occasionally I'd put 100 quid or 200 quid in whenever I had the money um, and I was working in a shop so I didn't have um, the greatest means of saving but I think because I did it for such a long time that helped get the deposit established and then we had quite a lot change suddenly in our lives family situations changed um, I lost a family member Aaron lost a family member everything happened all at once um, and it meant that we had to move house um, and I'd been searching on Rightmove for a couple of years because we knew it was going to happen at some point. We just didn't know it was going to happen as quickly as it did. Um, and this place came up and it had been on the market for a long time. Nobody wanted to live here because it lacked a lot of things like heating. Um, the decor wasn't exactly nice. Uh, a lot of things needed repairing. The windows were leaking. Um, things that as a first time buyer we were much more willing to overlook than maybe someone who's more experienced with buying houses or someone who's done renovations before and um, I fell in love with the place as soon as I stepped in. Uh, Aaron took a little bit longer to warm to it but 
as we started looking at other houses, there was just something about this one that felt really, really right. And we came back and quickly said, we would like to buy the house, that's the one. Uh, we ended up doing a lot more work on it than we expected. And I think if we'd known how much work it was gonna be, possibly wouldn't have moved here. But um, the main appeal was the garden. And for a lot of people our age uh, who weren't able to work at home or were commuting to the city and then would get back late, um, the garden was a, a bit of a, a bad point about this house. But for us, because I was working at home most of the time, um, the garden was something that felt amazing to me and worked with our lifestyles. So we were really lucky there, lucky that every everything went ahead, but also a lot of people had had the opportunity to have this, have this house and had turned it down because of the work that needed doing. Um, and I think I've learned so much from that process that if we do move or when we do move, um, there'll be a lot more that I'll look out for and that I'll know about now. And also the way that we will renovate, we've learned how to use old materials that are in keeping with the time period of a house uh, and how to look after it and kind of bring back those original features and have it have a really nice cottagey feel. And another question about autism. So the question is, how did you understand and accept that you have to take the first steps to get diagnosed? Um, so I think the first thing about that question is in this country and for a lot of other people around the world, diagnosis isn't an easy option and it's very much a privilege. It might cost money, you might have to wait a really long time. It's very hard to see someone that will believe you if you aren't a white man, basically, or a child. I'm very lucky that I was able to go down that route. I know there are a lot of people that can't, um, but I basically would say I've known for the longest time that I've had difficulties with socialising and sensory issues, but I didn't have a word for it. And then Aaron and I watched Atypical on Netflix together and Aaron turned to me and he was like, isn't it funny that this boy has exactly the same problems as you, but he's got a word for it and he has help for it. And then it was like something clicked and I was like, ah, oh. <laughs> it's autism. <laughs> and it was like suddenly everything came together at once and I started doing a lot of reading and a lot of relating to people's experiences, but I think Ironically, even though the actor that plays Sam in Atypical isn't autistic, um, some of the themes that come up are very similar to our lives. And I think my main reason for wanting the diagnosis was to get my people in my life off my back a bit, because people don't understand autism, they don't know what it looks like in women. People might have worked with a group of autistic people that present in a certain way. Those of us that don't fit in that group are not welcome under the diagnostic umbrella, shall we say. And I wanted to get people off my case because I was saying to people, I think I might be autistic. And they're like, no, you're crazy. You're the most normal person ever. And yet in the same breath, they'll say things like, you're so awkward, you're so eccentric, you're so unusual. And it's like a really weird double standard, I guess. And I wanted to people, get people off my case and I could say, whether I was or I wanted to get the diagnosis, then I could have the validation that I either was or wasn't and I could be confident and then I could say to people, I've been diagnosed or I was wrong, I'm not. And I, that was something that I've learned. Um, but turns out I am, I was diagnosed and now I can say to people, just get off my case. You need to go and learn about it because I've been diagnosed and that's how it is. Um, but it's a massive journey and I definitely could talk about it for a really, really long time uh, if there are people here that want to hear about it. And thank you for asking, because it's nice to be able to talk about it. So I have a question that says, how do you keep the grass from creeping into your flower beds? And how do you treat plants that are being eaten by earwigs and other nasties? So I'll start with the first bit about creeping grass. Um, I would say we are actually quite messy people. Uh, I'm not always on top of the garden. Um, sometimes it feels stressful. Uh, and when I'm making videos, generally I will show the nice parts of the garden. Sometimes I show the messy parts, but there are always more jobs to be done. Um, I don't have anyone helping me. It's just me and my spare time and I work. So the reality of it is that we don't really stop the grass uh, creeping into the flower beds and things will tend to build up um, to a bad point until I'll say I need to dedicate some time to doing that next and I'll get on top of it and then there'll be another thing. And that's the reality of gardening uh, when you're doing it on your own in a biggish space with not much time. Um, and then when it comes to pests, we sometimes have problems with pests, but I think 
Uh, we have a couple of things that help. So the ducks help massively with slugs and snails. Sometimes they eat flies and caterpillars as well, depending on what they can find. Um, and we also, we don't use pesticides. We kind of go down an organic approach where we try to encourage biodiversity into the garden. So birds and bats will eat um, some of the winged insects or, or slugs and snails. Um, and then ladybirds will eat aphids if you encourage them into your garden. But you have to let the aphids be there in the first place if you want to let the predators in. Um, so we go by that mantra. <clears throat> For the most part, it works. Sometimes it doesn't. And then we also try to mix up our planting quite a lot. So we don't have big areas of monocropping. We try to mix things into one bed so there's a bit of diversity so the pests don't get super attractive to one bed and completely swamp it. There'll be a few pests and a few predators, good soil health, um, and I love that way of gardening. <laughs> a question that says, do our dogs ever trouble the runner ducks? And the answer to that is yes. Um, so Epi, our female dog, she would love to eat them. She has a very strong hunting instinct and we just have to keep her away from them at all costs. Um, she cannot be trusted. And then Silas, our boy, he doesn't really want to eat them. I think he just wants to look at them, but they're still frightened of him and he'll run up to them uh, and they will be frightened. So we can't unfortunately let the dogs out with the ducks. Um, I think in future we might look for breeds of dogs that are more of like a sheepdog or a protector so that they can help us with the ducks because um, I think we're both keen on having dogs and ducks for a long time. So if that ever becomes an option that might be the, the way that we go um, but we've had these dogs for, well Epi we've had for about six years and it was before we lived here and before we had ducks um, and she's a lovely dog, I wouldn't change her for the world but it is difficult to manage them with the ducks. Um, I've got a question that says what are your favourite and least favourite aspects of cottage and country living and I think hands down my least favourite part is the cost so there are things that are just more expensive about the house. Well a good one is the windows are single glazed so we lose a lot of heat so we have to take a lot of extra measures like we're going to put in secondary glazing, get some really thick curtains um, but it's the cases where you might miss the modern luxuries or by retrofitting the modern luxuries they might cost a bit more. We're also off the grid for heating, so we have to um, have an electric heating system. So we've got an air source heat pump, which is brilliant, but with the cost of electric going up, don't know how we're going to manage, so that's terrifying. And yeah, it's uh, those hidden costs, I think. Um, and I'm sure there are more problems to be found just because of the age of the house. So last time when we were working on the bathroom, we found out that um, the floorboards and the joists were completely uh, rotten and we had to have those replaced um, just because it's so old and there have been so many leaks over time. It's just things that are problems occur over time. This house has had a lot of time uh, so there are problems to be fixed and that's definitely a nuisance but it also means that some of the materials are really resilient. We've still got the original floors here and to think that they're 250 years old is amazing and they're beautiful and I love them. Um, so that that's kind of the reasons why I like it is that um, it's so comforting and resilient and I just find old things make me feel safe and secure um, and they remind me that things can be made to last and be made properly and I don't like fast paced things, I don't like throw away things, I don't like hauls, I like old clutter, happy colours, <laughs> that kind of thing and waking up and coming downstairs and being surrounded by that just makes me feel really really good. Um, so that's a favourite thing about cottage living. And then as for living in the countryside, it's quite hard to ever be far away from things. Um, I think just by nature, living in England, it's such a small country, you're never super far away from a city. Um, sometimes I wish we could order food to the house. <laughs> that's about the only thing I can think of, but I would never trade that for living in a city. I'm so much happier living in the country just for the quiet and being near nature and the walks. I absolutely love it. I would never live in a city if I could help it, but um, you never know. Never say never, I suppose, but right now I'm very happy where we are and I love living in the countryside. Um, I have a question about um, preserving food and it says, I'd like to know, do you prepare some supplies and canning food for winter? What do your winter meals look like? Do you cook a lot from your vegetable garden? Um, so I would say overall, 
we're still in a transition period where we're not self-sufficient by any stretch. We buy a lot of food from shops, but we'd like to lean more towards being self-sufficient in certain areas. So things that we can grow really easily here and all year round, um, or that store really easily are things like onions, garlic, kale. And then we, we do preserve things like tomatoes and plums just in the freezer um, and apples as well. Um, make an apple crumble, put it in the freezer and we can eat that in the winter. But we're not very good at canning stuff and I really would like to get better at canning and make, making jams and preserves. Um, I've got a big jam pan, I've made a couple but it's not something I'm super experienced with and I think it will come with time. Like I said, we've only been here for three years. Uh, hopefully we've got a lot longer where we can start learning these skills but it's definitely something I want to work on and hopefully I'll be able to share with you one day as well. A good question, what do you do to centre yourself when you're feeling overwhelmed? And let me tell you that happens a lot. <laughs> if I'm able to, I will just come home, go to bed, draw the curtains, put earplugs in and sit in a dark room, not asleep but just doing absolutely nothing and trying to decompress my brain because um, I do get overwhelmed a lot. I get really overstimulated if I go to like a supermarket or a city. Um, I can enjoy being there for the time, but as soon as I'm out of this situation, it's like my nervous system will just collapse and I'll get onto the brink of having a meltdown. So for me, dark rooms and blocking out as much stimulation as I can are like an essential part of my well-being. Um, but before I get to that stage where it becomes crucial to do that, I try to make sure that I engage with things that make me feel good as often as I can. So I try to walk every day, I try to get out in the garden every day and having the pets really helps with that because you have to walk your dogs and you have to go out and look after the animals. Um, so I'd say that's the best thing that stops me from feeling overwhelmed. But in the same breath, having a big garden and doing it on your own can be overwhelming in itself. So it's all on balance but generally those things make me feel really good. I've got a couple of questions about bulbs and autumn planting and I won't go into detail now but that's something I'm really excited about and I will make videos about that in the coming weeks. I will be doing a lot of bulb planting and um, I will make some videos about that and I just can't wait to share it with you because it's my favourite. I love spring and preparing for spring is like one of my favourite things to do in the garden so look forward to that. I've got a question that says, love your bathroom reno. Do you have any other plans for renovating the cottage? Um, so I'll link to the bathroom reno up here if you want to watch that. Um, in terms of big renovations, it all just depends on if we can afford it. In an ideal world, we'd like to do the kitchen. Um, I don't think we'll be able to afford it anytime soon. We'd also like to put double glazing in um, to help with the insulation of the cottage in winter. But again, it's a really costly job. Don't know if we'll get around to doing it. Um, but apart from those two things, everything else that we need to do in the house at least is finishing touches. So uh, we'd like to change the radiators to make them pretty because they're just bog standard radiators. We'd like to change the skirting boards because they're not finished and when we had our floor taken down <laughs> the skirting board boards are all like an inch or two too high. Um, Lots of little finishing touches. We want to paint our bedroom, but nothing drastic beyond doing the kitchen. Um, and we're fine if we don't do the kitchen, it's not broken. Um, it's just a cosmetic change. And then in the garden, it's the same kind of thing. If we had a big amount of money, there would be things that we change, um, but it's probably not gonna happen. So we've got the greenhouse, um, which is full of cacti, and we want to get that converted into a working greenhouse that we can use to grow things like tomatoes. That's probably something we can do ourselves with a bit of time. Uh, we also possibly will build a bigger enclosure now that we've, we've got more ducks than we expected to have, um, but it will depend on the situation. Some of the ducks might turn out to be boys, in which case we can't keep them because they'd fight. Uh, so they might be okay with the space we've got, but if not, we'll build a bigger one. And then beyond that, it's probably things like tidying up the area, buying new plants, little things that will happen over time and are already happening. But I'd say the point we've got to now, we're quite happy with how things are. All the big jobs are done in the house, the essential ones at least. Um, and the worst is over, I hope. <laughs> I think this is a really good question. And it says, how did you figure out the lifestyle that you wanted to live by? I'm having problems figuring it out. Um, and one thing I would say is that for the longest time in my early 20s, I felt like I didn't have things figured out and I was trying to fit myself into other people's way of living and then wondering why it wasn't working. 
now I know I'm autistic and face blind, it makes a lot of sense, but I would work in an office and I thought everyone struggled with it and didn't know how to talk to people or how to switch between these different personas. Um, and then once I got my diagnosis, I realised that that's something other people are okay with and I'm not and that I do need to shape my life differently. So I think it's like getting to know yourself in a really deep way, which happens with time, and then understanding what your needs are and how you can achieve that within your means. Um, so I think the things for me were like knowing I need a lot of quiet, I like to be near nature if possible, uh, I need animals in my life, um, I don't like spending a lot of time with people. So I think probably I'd say it's good to um, ask yourself some questions about yourself. But I think also don't blame yourself if you don't know what you want because it happens and there's so much pressure for us to have done things by certain ages or to look a certain way or act a certain way and it's all rubbish but you we all internalize it and feel like we have to do those things or, or that we might be a bad person if we're not and not everyone's on the same journey and I just I think I hope that you end up in your happy place but to be gentle with yourself if you're not there yet because it's not your fault. And I think that's probably enough questions because I have rambled a bit now uh, and I didn't realise my camera cut out because I was rambling so much and I had to stop the video again. So uh, we'll call it a day, but thank you so much for sending in the questions. It's been really nice to talk about them and uh, I've loved it. I will try and make a QA and a probably every half a year just to update you, check in and catch up. Thanks for watching and give us a subscribe if you enjoy these videos.